to David uh, for coming from London, Ontario. Uh, he's one of our most uh, accomplished uh, historians of probability theory, and specializing, specializing in the uh, 18th century England. Yes. Well, thank you for inviting me. I came uh, just in time for your election. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm leaving just in time before the votes are counted. So I won't find out till I get home. OK, to start, um, what motivated me to work on this and eventually wind up as a book was reading uh, Lorraine Daston's book, um, on probability in the, in the Enlightenment, I think it's called. And what I found in, in looking a little further was there are a whole number of different sets of people interested in the history of insurance or annuities insurance in 18th century uh, Britain. Um, statisticians like Carl Pearson had written about it. Um, there were actuaries writing in the 19th century kind of uh, giving uh, where they came from or trying to prove to uh, the general public that that uh, insurance is really based on sound scientific principles. Historians of science like Lorraine Dassons have looked at it. Uh, look at one uh, social historian uh, as it comes up and economic historians have looked at annuities from the point of view of the of the, the national debt as it was established um, in Britain, and the national get debt got established because of of the wars with France, starting in just prior to 1700, uh, wars uh, William the uh, Third and Louis the Fourteenth, and those were financed by life annuities, the sale of life annuities. So to start with Daston. Um, she wrote a paper uh, ab about the, uh, the problem, and then it wound up in her book. Uh, she says, despite the efforts of mathematicians to apply probability theory and mortality statistics to problems in insurance and annuities in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the influence of this mathematical literature on the voluminous trade in annuities and insurance was negligible until the end of the 18th century. A social historian is essentially saying, said the same thing. Her name's Eve Rosenhaft. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but what's outlined there in red is the central puzzle in the history of insurance is this. Basically, once again, the market in insurance emerged. Um, kind of at the same time as these mathematicians were working, but the insurance industry had no use for the, for the mathematicians. Uh, they didn't rely on any of the books. So it came down to the question of what were these mathematicians doing in the 18th century? Nobody paid attention to them, or it seemed like nobody was paying attention to them. Um, were they writing for themselves? Or who were they writing for? And when I began to answer that question, I saw a whole different uh, aspect of uh, life contingencies or life contingent contracts. Um, it was totally different from insurance. So the insurance people ignored the mathematicians, but at the same time, the mathematicians ignored the insurance industry. They were doing something different. So let's look at a few insurance companies and see why they didn't need any mathematicians. Um, the first one uh, is called the Amicable Society for, for a Perpetual Assurance Office. It actually is still in existence today. It was bought out in the 19th century and uh, is now part of Norwich Union, which is part of Aviva Insurance. So it does still exist um, in one way, shape, or form. Founded in 1706, what they did was had 2,000 policyholders. Everybody paid a premium of six pounds, four shillings. Um, and the death benefit was to take 10,000 pounds and divide it by the number of deaths. So you didn't need a mathematician. 
uh, to predict what was going to happen. The death benefit was variable from year to year. It all depended on how many people died. The Life uh, London Assurance Corporation was founded in 1720. It had been a fire insurance uh, business, but they moved into life insurance. They sold one year term insurance beginning in 19, 1721, and they charged a flat premium no matter what. It was typically uh, five pounds per hundred pounds of insurance. And it's interesting, I have read through uh, some of the insurance books and it's interesting to see that um, the five pounds ten shillings was charged maybe on people that they thought were a little more risky, but the five pounds five shillings were charged mainly to the aristocracy. Five pounds five shillings being five guineas and the aristocracy liked to talk in terms of guineas instead of pounds. So you paid an extra five shillings because you're an aristocrat, probably for no other reason. So, uh, can you back up to that? Oh, you're going to tell me what happened to that company, okay. Just a sec, yeah. What, what was the question? Uh, I think your next slide is about what my question Okay. So, what happened, not to the company, but what happened with the policies? Daston was right. Um, the mathematicians had no impact on the insurance companies well into the 18th century. So what I did was, I was in the uh, London Metropolitan Archives and I uh, photographed uh, the policy books for 1735, 1745, and I went through all of the policies. It gave, for every policy where they gave the age of the insurance applicant, I calculated uh, the value of a one-year ter one term insurance on uh, 100 pounds worth of insurance and then I got the premium that they charged. So what I did then was I took um, the premium that they uh, should have charged, the actual premium, no, got it, I may have the ba wrong way around. What they should have charged um, was a lot smaller than what they were charging. So they were really overcompensating. They were taking very little risk. I think they got the idea that in London, England, about one in 20 people died every year. I thought this was fire. So, mm -hmm. I thought your previous slide said this was fire. Well, this was a fire company that started selling life insurance. Oh. And they sold one year term insurance. But they were all, and, and were they selling fire insurance before that? And, yeah, and they were selling, uh, they sold fire insurance and then they sold life insurance. Oh, but this is the life insurance? This is the life insurance. And I think William Petty or somebody similar had noticed that about one in, in London, one in 20 people die every year. So if they charge five pounds on 100 pounds, you got the one in 20. Um, so you're able to cover the risk the risk was a lot uh, 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 lower, so they really overcharged on the premium. So they were charging, according to these box plots, um, anywhere from 20% uh, to 80% um, of, of the actual premium that was needed, so they were really overcharging. Um, and so there, there was no way they could have gone out of business because they were really overcharging and people only wanted one year term insurance for uh, after going on a trip somewhere or they need to cover a debt and so uh, when you are interviewing someone on one year term insurance you've got a pretty good idea of whether or not that person is going to last the year. Uh, not completely but you know when you see a sick person you're not going to give them insurance. So they carry that on for it's almost based on the uh, on, on on the actual deaths that company paid out on. Um, no, they just again charged your your data. Was my data was the actual um, payouts, not the payouts. What they charged, what the insurance company charged, which was say five pounds, and what the actuarial premium really should have been for a one year term insurance, which and, was and your less than five pounds. And that was based on overall death it, rates? That was based on Halley's life table. Uh, oh, no, maybe not Halley's, it could have been 
uh, the Northampton life table. I picked a life table that was typical of the time. Okay, back again. The life table that you're talking about, was that, I, I, they weren't using life tables to price these. No, not at all. And was the notion of a life table... Uh, the notion of a life table was around. Halley had come up with one in 1693. And that was, also, that was for pricing insurance? Um, no, he did not use it to price insurance. Um, he suggested a one-year term insurance could be used. It was kind of an afterthought. Um, to his paper. Um, I will get to Halley's paper in, in a bit. Um, but again, now you have the problem with the life insurance company, as I demonstrated in the last slide, we're ignoring the mathematicians. But the mathematicians were producing an enormous literature on life annuities, uh, life contingent contracts. De Mauve had four additions to his book, Simpson had three, there were other guys, James Dodson, James Hodson. Price had, and we'll get to Price in more detail, uh, he had several editions of his book on annuities. And uh, then there was another guy named Francis Masser, um, again, in the 1780s. So there's lots of things being produced, and these have, are all being ignored by the insurance companies. So when, why is there a difference? Well, the difference, I feel, is that there are two kinds of life annuities. One deals with property, and the other deals with straight annuity contracts. So in terms of property, in England, there was a system of leasing land called leases for lives. So you leased land, and the people, you have named three people on the lease, and the lease ran out after the last person named on the lease died. If um, if, if you had three people on the lease and one person died, uh, you could renew the lease by adding a third person and paying a fine. And the, and the fine, they had a specific way of dealing with the fine before they figured out uh, anything about life contingent uh, calculations. Trad so it's traditional pricing um, and started in the reign of Henry VIII. A, a lease on three lives was the equivalent of a 21-year lease. So that if one person died, you would replace it with a, another person, which meant you were adding another seven years to the lease. So you, you had a lease now that had run for 14 years, you're adding on another seven years. So the fine is the present value of the, seven, the last seven years payment that you're adding on. You have other things like reversions on property. Um, uh, uh, an example of a reversion is um, you were a landowner and you're, uh, say you're childless. Um, in your will, uh, on your death, the land goes to somebody else. So the land reverts to another person. So, um, and the, the person who is about to inherit could sell that reversion. Um, sell it in advance, get the money up front, and somebody else inherits instead. There are also marriage contracts. Um, a woman getting married um, had no source of income. Uh, typically, when she was married, she probably brought with her a dowry that was a payment to the, to the future husband. So um, in, uh, payment, in view of that payment, the husband would agree on his death to set aside part of the property to pay rent uh, to his spouse until she died, and then the land reverted back to the estate. On the other hand, there, was, there were annuity contracts. Um, originally, they were backed by property. That is, if you go to a bank today and buy an annuity, it's, it's backed by their in investments, but then it would be, if somebody ran out of money, it would be backed by a piece of property that would then, would then be sold to pay off the rest of the annuity. And it changed in the 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century, with the wars of William III. He sold uh, life annuities in order to raise money for his wars against Louis XIV. And so life annuities then became uh, sold on the open uh, market, and um, they, were very, they were very much based, or similarly based, as these um, uh, leases on lives. You could also purchase a reversion 
It's like purchasing a pension. Um, and again, there was a standard way to do it. This is an example of a marriage contract. This is uh, a painting by Hogarth, William Hogarth. Um, we have the aristocrat um, getting ready for his son uh, to marry this woman who is uh, the daughter of a merchant. He is bringing money, the merchant is bringing money into the, into the family. And so uh, essentially she's being sold off because he wants a title uh, for his grandson. Um, so that's the, the, the nature of the, the uh, um, Hogarth satire. We have the priest here uh, giving advice to the, uh, to the young woman who's about to get married. You have the lawyers drawing up the contracts uh, between the aristocrat and the, the merchant. And you have the son who just doesn't give a damn. He's looking off into the, <laughs> into the, into the probably it's something else. Um, so uh, that again is Hogarth satirizing uh, the way in which uh, property worked and the way in which money changed hands in the 18th century. So, um, first thing to do is to look at annuities prior to the 18th century. Uh, the, these mathematicians were working on these problems in the 18th century, so what was happening prior to that? So we have at the top uh, 1613, a man has a lease uh, that goes for 30 years uh, yet to come for which time he used to pay 40 pounds a year, uh, 10 pounds per quarter rent, how much money shall uh, he pay to his landlord to bring the rent down to uh, 20 shillings a quarter, reckoning interest at, one, at 16 years purchase. So uh, 16 years purchase is I think one over 16th for the interest rate. Um, so that's a typical annuity that's coming in which is rent on land. Um, then again, in the middle of the 17th century, uh, we have another guy, Henry Phillips, writing, uh, there is another way of purchasing land or houses, by buying leases therein, and this is the ordinary rule for it. One life is anything uh, is accounted for equal worth to a, a lease of seven years, two lives are worth as much as a lease of 14, three lives are worth as much as a lease of 21, and so on. So. In, instead of being able to calculate the value of a life annuity, which is amount coming in regularly until death, they have equated one life as a, 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 an annuity of length seven years, three lives as an annuity of length 21 years, and that's the way leases on lives were, were uh, calculated throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. But the point was, the, the point of the calculation was you were using the interest rate and applying it to 21 years. Yes. But in fact, the person get, get, got to keep it at that annual. The in person. Fact, they could keep it until all three people were not dead. They, had they it, kept it until death. Until the three deaths. Until the three deaths, or they could renew the lease by bringing another person in, right. they, and then it goes it, on for another 21 years. They just kept it until the three deaths. How much would they pay? Would um, they, they would have would paid. They, would they benefit by living more than 21 years? Yes, because to pay to, you had to pay this thing up front. So if you bought, if you bought a lease for three lives, you paid uh, the present value of an annuity going for 21 years. I see. So you pay up front. You paid up front. But but the farmer can't pay up front. Um, well, that was the thing. The farmer. Um, um, didn't necessarily pay up front. He may have he paid part of it up front and then paid yearly rents as well. Um, so that when, so, we, so what happened was it was a mixture of the two. You had a 21 year lease which you paid a chunk of money for and that your family had to save up for when it became up for renewal. Um, so, and then there was also yearly rents. Um, so what the landlord was getting was every seven years, because you would renew the lease every seven years, you'd bring in another person, you'd, you'd pay a big chunk every seven years and smaller amounts every year. So you had to save up in order to, to uh, pay your landlord. And how were those smaller amounts being calculated? Um, it was just 
I'm not sure, just the, year, just the yearly rent. Um, I see. Not, um, would they be paid to the same landlord? Or would pay to the same landlord. There's not some other money? Uh, no, the but the landlord may be also be paying to another landlord. Yeah. Um, we'll get to that in another one, I think. Okay. Could you rent for just one life, or did it have to be for three? Uh, you could. Um, that would be too uh, risky. I uh, might be seen as too risky. Um, leases on three lives were seen as a way to keep the property in the family almost forever. Because if it's on three lives, uh, if one person goes, you can always find somebody else to come in. So if it's a, if it's a, a farmer, with a wife and a son, or a wife and a couple of sons. Um, if the farmer dies, the wife takes over, or the son takes over the lease, brings in his son, or brings in his brother, so you can keep the, you know, the, the whole object is to keep the property within the family. And so you would not want a lease for one life. So now we get to Edmund Halley. Um, 1693, um, he um, has been sent data um, through the uh, Royal Librarian in, in London, uh, coming from the librarian uh, in Hanover, who was Leibniz. Uh, the, the, and Leibniz has got the data from a guy in Germany, so it's gone in a roundabout way. It gets to London. And Halley looks at the data, and they're basically, uh, for five years, it's the age of death of everyone in the city, or everyone in a particular parish in the city of Breslau, uh, which is now part of Poland. So he has this data, and then he decides, hmm, uh, there's something I can do with this, and he comes up with this life table. Um, so he, he, since he has the ages of death, of everyone for five years. So he started off with approximately a thousand people. He actually started off with more. But of the thousand people who were born, uh, sorry, there were a thousand people, I'm going to get myself mixed up. Um, since he has the age of death, 855 of those died at age two. Um, Still so we're still alive at age two. Sorry, yeah. So he has the number of deaths at each age. I had the wrong. That's why I was getting mixed up. I mentally put the wrong, put it the wrong way around. So he had started off with a thousand people. Eight people had died at the age of one by before the age of one. Nine people died. Nine plus eight died before the age of, of two, etc. And so he was able to construct this life table uh, in that way. Um, the, I wrote a paper that's in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, Series C, showing how Halley fudged his data, made things to come up to a nice even 34,000 as the population of Breslau. It was about another couple hundred larger. Um, when you actually look at the data, um, the data did exist up into the 19th century. Um, so anyway, he came up with this life table. On that table, I guess the, the median age was between 34, about 34 years old was the yep. median age. Uh, I guess that's... 500, where's 500 on this table? 586? 33, 34. Right here, yeah. 40, 41. No, it, yeah, 33, 34. Where, where, oh yeah, 30, where are we going? Yes, 33, 34, median age. Wow. Why is that? Why is that median age so low? look at the number of uh, deaths of young people. The, the death rate among the young was very high, um, and so that's what's bringing down the median age. If you survived to age 20, you were actually pretty good for, it was, it was more, more, not more like modern times, but it was, it was more modern, uh, that your chances of survival further were better once you reached the age of 20 or 25. Yeah. You said that Leibniz just was the same Leibniz who helped, I guess, found the calculus? Yeah. He was the, he was the librarian for George I. Really? Um, before George came from Hanover to England, uh, 
He was the court librarian there. That's what Leibniz did for his living. Which became a problem when George I came to, to England in 1714. That was the height of the controversy between Leibniz and Newton. So they couldn't possibly get Leibniz into England without causing a huge fight with Newton. So Leibniz stayed back in Hanover. I'm not sure if uh, that was a f the official reason, but there was certainly one reason for Leibniz to stay where he was and not follow George I uh, across the English Channel. So, um, in um, Halley's paper, uh, he talks about the fund lately granted to their majesties, uh, and then what was called was the Million Act of 1692, which was raise a million pounds by selling life annuities uh, to pay for the wars of William III. So the original price to get a life annuity of one pound a year was seven years purchase. Or if you wanted 50 pounds a year as your life annuity, you paid 50 times seven uh, to get that amount. So that really amounted in terms of uh, uh, an interest rate, the government was paying interest rates of in around like 14% on the money. Uh, and that was because they desperately needed the money and the risk was high uh, for um, of, uh, not being able to pay the loan. And uh, uh, so because the more risk you have, higher the interest rate. And again, this seven years, the reason why they chose seven years purchase is again related to leases on lives. Uh, here's another example from 1715, an estate near London, 80 pounds a year, based on three lives, 21 years renewable. So three lives, 21 years divided by three, seven years. So the seven years purchase in the annuity for, the, the life annuity for supporting the national debt or to the, or wound up as the national debt is the same as a, uh, the, the, what's coming out of leases for lives. There's no, yep. there's no logical connection. None whatsoever. Yep. <laughs> so, Halley stated a number of applications for his table. He wanted, uh, he was in, in the uh, uh, in the same vein as John Grant's a uh, book on uh, analyzing uh, the bills of mortality in the city of London in 1660 to 1665. Halley was, his first reason for looking at this is you could estimate the proportion of men able to bear arms uh, in England. Uh, you could apply this thing to England, uh, so you could basically get the size of the army so that you know could work out the power of the nation. France was much bigger, so it had to be much more powerful because you could get more men in arms. To show the differing degrees of mortality, or rather vitality in all ages, to get the median age of death, which we just discussed. And then further down the list, to price one year term insurance, which uh, was ignored by the life insurance companies which didn't start until 1706. 1693, there were no insurance companies. You could buy a one-year term insurance, but it was basically related to marine insurance. It was for the guys going out sailing and trading. You buy a one-year term insurance so that if you died, uh, your family would have money if you didn't come back. So how do you know it was ignored? Because as I showed in the previous slides, uh, I already priced one-year term insurance for the London Insurance Company and it had no relationship, what they were charging had no relationship to the actuarial, true actuarial premiums to charge for one-year term insurance. But from his mentioning this, one could suppose you were deducing that before the London Insurance Company was founded, people were already selling this. Yes, and it was based on um, you, you came in and you had an interview with somebody and they sized up whether or not they thought you would survive the year. Yeah. Which... And then they overcharged you by a tremendous... And then they overcharged you. So you don't think any of those people would have had uh, Halley's uh, table in their desk? No. Before. No, I don't think so. 
they were always charging so much it wasn't better. Uh, I, th I think what if they relied on any statistics, I think there was a, a book by William Petty that gave um, the death rate is like one in twenty um, overall death rate, yeah. so that you can have, you know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. five pounds on a hundred pounds is one in twenty. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then he wants to price. Uh, annuities on lives and the advantage of investing in the exchequer annuities and he uh, um, uh, the thing at the bottom is a quote from the paper that shows the great advantage of putting money in the present fund um, again that uh, resulted in the beginning of the national debt for England that was totally ignored by the government after this particular set of annuities more annuities came out in the reign of William III and the reign of Queen Anne, um, and they completely ignored anything to do with uh, uh, Halley and his table. Um, they basically went on this leases for lives um, um, scenario. Again, seven, uh, seven years purchase uh, uh, for the, the annuity, and it's resulting in about 14% uh, interest. Uh, that the government is paying. But again, the government is desperate to raise money in order to carry out these wars. Um, so, Halley's, I would say, Halley's initial motivation to work on the Breslau data had nothing to do with insurance. Um, his comments on annuities and life insurance were almost afterthoughts. They came as the last couple of uh, uh, uses of his table. Uh, had no impact uh, outside a few circle of uh, mathematicians who are writing commercial arithmetic books, and I'll get into one of those in a sec. Um, and he also recognized that if you were to do the uh, calculations properly, you had an enormous amount of calculation by hand, very time consuming, very laborious, and that is probably one of the reasons why um, his life table was ignored by the insurance industry. Um, again, doing the calculations is very time consuming. So here's one example of the impact that he did have with other mathematicians. Uh, a guy named John Ward wrote a number of mathematics books. This one's called The Introduction to Mathematics. Uh, five editions up to, six editions up to the 1725. Uh, and what he does with Halley's book, or Halley's result, is he merely copies right out of Halley's paper. So what you get in the, in, in the, the math book is a section on, uh, it might be here somewhere, uh, there's a section on, uh, right here, the whole business of interest in annuities fully and plainly handled, so he covers annuity certain, and then when he gets to life annuities, he just takes what Halley had written in his paper, copies it into the book. Does that six times in a row. And that's under your algebra. Yes. Because the calculation of a fixed term annuity is simple algebra. So along comes Abraham de Moivre in 1725, writes a book called Annuities Upon Lives. Um, the interesting thing is he doesn't mention the uses. He gives you some numerical examples, but never truly mentions uh, a sp specific examples or where it would be used. And I think the reason for that, it was obvious to his readers uh, where uh, the results would be used. I think the motivation was property. It all had to do with the topics covered in the book. He covered single life annuities, but he also covered joint life annuities that would apply to leases for lives. He covered reversions. Again, um, um, not that was reversions weren't something that were normally offered in the in the marketplace. Um, for um, a single life annuity, he used an approximation with uh, using a linear survival curve, so that when it came to calculating uh, the present value of the annuity, you had a um, you had the sum of an arithmetic geometric progression. 
Um, so there was a nice simple formula for the present value. For joint lives, he had a mixture, a uh, mixture that really didn't fit together. For the single life annuity, he would calculate um, using the linear survival curve, but then to calculate joint uh, uh, life annuities, he would use an exponential curve so he can multiply things together nicely and find the, uh, find the, um, the, the infinite series, or find the, the series. Um, this book had, did have immediate impact, and where the impact occurred mostly were people dealing with leases, people dealing with property. So John Richards, book called The uh, Gentleman's Steward, uh, Gail Morris, Tables for Renewing and Purchasing Leases, Wayman Lee, Essay to Ascertain the Value of Leases and Annuities. Um, so the people who picked up on it mostly were interested in property. The guy who just wrote generally about annuities was a guy named Richard Hayes. He was a mathematics teacher in London. He taught um, uh, things to do with uh, not only annuities certain, but he taught about uh, the, the, the stock market, accounting, and uh, these are all topics in his school. Um, and so he was trying to cater to the annuities market that was um, available in London, uh, perhaps not catering successfully. Now, where this takes off, I would say, is in consulting. So, and this is something you don't see. There are not too many, there's not much um, uh, surviving material in archives dealing with consulting on uh, life annuities. But there are five major players. There are actually six, but I got five here. Demov is the first. William Jones, who is a friend of Demov's, is there. Richard Price, the guy who presented Bayes' paper to the Royal Society, comes up in the 1770s. His nephew, William Morgan, uh, consults in annuities as well. And there's no picture of, no portrait of Thomas Simpson, but here's a picture of his book front page of his book. So five, five guys are working away on annuity contracts or, or life contingent contracts. And when you look at what they were doing in consulting, they are all related to property. So Demov says um, in, a, in an ad that he put in uh, the paper in 1739 when his second edition of the Doctrine of Chances came out, uh, talks about uh, picking it up. Uh, the people who uh, uh, subscribe to the book should pick it up at Slaughter's Coffee House. Uh, but then he goes on to say he also takes this opportunity of making it his request to those who are pleased to consult him by letter about any case relating to leases for a number of years certain or to annuity for annuities upon lives to mention the rate of interest I, which is agreed upon between the contracting parties. So he is sitting in Slaughter's Coffee House talking to clients, getting value, getting evaluations of properties, properties meaning rents coming in on leases or uh, yeah, rents coming in on, uh, on various properties. Um, he also, there's one other that comes up and uh, again it, it, just, it shows Dubois as a, as a consultant um, and the discretion you needed to have as a consultant, today, uh, if you're being a consultant, you don't tell anybody else about what you're working on. You don't want the competition to find out. So this poor guy had come in to ask Dumois for some information. Uh, and Dumois said, come back in a few days. He came back in a few days, and he kicked him out. He didn't recognize who he was, so he wouldn't give him the answer. And then he realized, oh yeah, that's the guy I talked to, and he put this ad in the newspaper uh, saying uh, he shall come back, receive entire satisfaction about the same, and his pardon asked, asked for the answer he received, it being not immediately rec uh, recollected by reason of different dress and other circumstances that he was the same person who some days before had proposed the question. So this poor guy, uh, again, had been kicked out of the, the coffee house uh, because Dubois didn't want his clients' information to get to anybody else. Um, now, here's a, 
uh, a consulting um, question that was put to Thomas Simpson. Um, and again, it's not obvious that it relates to property, but it's probably related to uh, some lease that these people held. Um, how many years purchase must be deducted from the price of an estate in fee simple in consideration of the joint lives of a woman 57 years old and of a woman 37 years old, both of them but moderately healthy? So that's basically the present value of a, uh, an annuity on two lives. Um, and the rest of the questions are similar until you get to the fourth question, which is really uh, what uh, the, the uh, person wanting the consulting uh, was after. What abatement must be from, made from the price of an estate in consideration of a debt of 18,135 pounds, whereof 22,000 pounds pays at interest 4%, and the remaining 16,135 pounds pays only 3.5%, all of which is to, to be paid by the present possessor, the woman of age 37, and after her decease, uh, the purchaser of the reversion must take that encumbrance, principal in interest upon himself. So, all, all very complicated, but basically, it's a problem related to property. So, the preamble might be any annuity, but the, the real question is a valuation of a property. Here are two um, situations uh, that face the consultants. You could get an easy question, or you get a difficult question, and it all depends on the mathematical abilities of, of the person asking the question. So the first case is a case uh, from Abraham Dubov, and the second case is one from Thomas Simpson. So the first is uh, Dubov's consulting report. According to your desire, I send you uh, the solution to the three questions you asked me. Uh, what is the value of the reversion of an estate after 21 years, supposing the estate worth 25 years purchase? Uh, so basically, what you're looking at is, uh, since it's 25 years to your purchase, it's 25 times the purchase price, uh, 25 times, sorry, times the rent you're going to get. Um, <clears throat> 25 years purchase also means one over 25, 4% interest. Um, and so you're getting a perpetuity at 4% interest. So. What's it worth, uh, where to go, um, after 21 years? So you're purchasing this perpetuity 21 years in the future. So after 21 years, you will get this estate paying one pound a year. And Bob says that's uh, 11 years. Uh, so you, to pay for this one pound a year, starting 21 years in the future, you're going to be paying 11 pounds. So he's doing the same thing after 14 years and after 7 years. And notice the 7, 14, and 21 are all related to leases on lives. That's uh, one life, two lives, three lives. And it's a very, it's provided you have the interest tables, it's a very simple calculation that DeMauve probably raked in a few shillings for, uh, for that particular information of looking up something in a table. Simpsons was a little different. Um, he needed more information. It was a complicated case. This is a church uh, that owns property. Uh, so in order to form a just calculation of the purchase under consideration and to determine the advantage or the disadvantage of the dean and chapter in accepting the terms proposed, I find it necessary to desire your answer to the following queries. And he has a whole list of questions. Uh, about the fine, about, um, uh, for example, the first one is, what is the present annual produce? Uh, what has been received uh, on average every year, i.e., what kind of rent is coming in? If he's going to evaluate this property, he wants to know what, what's the income from the property, and so on. Long and complicated. That would have taken a much more time than what the mob did, looking a few numbers up in a table. Um, here's another um, one put to William Jones, um, and this is an example of, if you've ever done uh, any kind of consulting, your uh, client 
when you say, well, when do you want this done, the client will say tomorrow, or later today, or as soon as possible. And this is the same thing. Um, the queries and next concern an intimate friend of mine, and I beg you to resolve them by tomorrow evening. And this poor Jones is doing annuity calculations, perhaps by hand. Uh, he's got other things to do, uh, but he's got to have this for his friend uh, the next day. Um, uh, I entreat you not to disappoint me. I'm obliged to dine at Hammersmith tomorrow, otherwise I'd, I'd pick it up in the morning. So <laughs> he'd rather even have it sooner than the next night. So what was the question? A lady of 35 years enjoys 2,200 pounds per annum in presence, sharing the lives of a man and his wife, the man 65, the woman 62. So the question is what the 200 pounds is worth to one that loses the interest of 6,000 uh, during the lives of the man and his wife. I'm not quite sure what that was getting at. Uh, same lady is to enjoy 400 pounds per annum on the death of the said man and his wife instead of 200 pounds. That one is, I, I can uh, understand more. So in that case, uh, what's the, tw uh, the 400 pounds per annum worth in reversion? So this lady is getting 200 pounds a year, but when the other two people die, she's getting 400 pounds a year. So what is that worth? And uh, this is not just a regular annuity, this is probably rent coming off property. Um, leases for lives. Again, there was a traditional way of doing it, uh, but um, in, in Scotland, it was in 1740, um, they were thinking of leases for lives, and so they were thinking of looking into the, uh, the new way of calculating these things. So the Earl of Hopeton uh, wrote to Jones and said, in this country, leases for lives are, are a new thing. Not, we're not acquainted with it. Um, so please help me with this. We have an estate of two, 700 pounds per annum, consisting of 50 pounds per annum, each set on a lease, each on a lease for three lives. And upon the failure of any one of these lives in each lease, the landlord is to receive a fine of 50 pounds and to add a new life to the lease. Um, so he wants to know how do you do this? Um, so again, it's all dealing with property. Um, covered this this morning, but this is a nice example of a, a case in the court where um, a soldier, a dragoon, had come, had bought a reversion, or he owned a reversion, sorry, on an estate. So when this man and his son both died, he got the estate. But he needed some money, so he sold his reversion, sold it to somebody else. But the man and his son both died within a month of the sale. So the dragoon sued, claiming that re the reversion was undervalued. So he wanted the sale canceled, he wanted his money back, essentially. He, uh, when he went before the court, he used Dumois' methodology to show what the true value should have been, but the high court the, of chancery ruled in favor of the defendant since it was sold without fraud. There was no fraud involved in the sale, so the sale was valid, but they awarded the cost to the poor soldier since the defendant had got such a good deal. Um, 16, 1760s are a pivotal uh, time for annuities in uh, Britain and, well, the, uh, the role of actuarial science. 1762, the Society for Equitable Assurances on Lives is found, is uh, set up. 1766, there is an annuity society called the Laudable Society for the Benefit of Widows. And in 1771, Price, Richard Price, looks at the proper financing of these insurance funds in his observations on reversionary payments. And that was a revolutionary book because in the 1770s, because of this laudable society for the benefit of widows, uh, which was quite successful, um, and they actually had a mathematical consultant named John Rowe, starting in three years later, a whole bunch of other annuity societies started. Provident Society, Equitable Society, Consolidated Society, Friendly Society, Rational Society, and they were all grossly underfunded, every last one of them. I had mentioned Rowe. Um, there's a notebook that uh, had been transcribed and uh, published uh, by the um, Institute of Actuaries, a guy in the Institute of Actuaries. 
his clients in terms of consulting were lawyers, again related to property um, purchases, um, a builder, uh, and a clergyman. So most of this, his consulting is dealing with, even in the late 18th century, is dealing with property valuations. So along comes Price, uh, who pricks this annuity bubble. Uh, he made a devastating criticism of these life annuity societies. Uh, he showed that they were all grossly under, underfunded and would soon run out of money. And so as a result of that publication, all but three of these annuity societies, uh, um, almost all of them, folded within three years of the publication of the book. One of the holdouts was this, the first one was the Laudable Society for the Benefit of, of Widows. And there is a story around that. Uh, there is a rogue consultant involved in that. Uh, if you know, you have, if you come before the courts and you find yourself a consultant, they'll always find a consultant for the other side to negate everything you ever said. So this is what happened in 1770, uh, or 1774. Uh, a mathematician named William Benjamin Webb, who was a math teacher in London, came forward to support uh, this um, uh, annuity society because the directors of the society had read Price's work, had believed in Price, and they, so they sought consultations from Price and two other mathematicians, Daniel Harris and James Horsfall, and all three of these guys recommended that the fees had to go up or otherwise you'd go broke. So the membership, of course, nobody wants to pay larger taxes. It's everywhere. It's even in the 18th century. These guys were paying a certain amount. They didn't want to pay any more. So the members of the society uh, got somebody else to say everything was okay. That was this guy Benjamin Webb. So the, the head of the society, knowing that the place would go bankrupt, um, petitioned Parliament to dissolve the society. And this was supported by Price, Harris, and Horsfall. And the people, the members of the society who still wanted to pay the lower premiums uh, and watch the place go bankrupt, uh, were supported by Webb. So it went before Parliament. The petitions went before Parliament. Uh, the Parliamentary Committee decided, well, we don't understand any of this, so we're going to send it to another mathematician. We'll send it to the prominent mathematician, who's the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics, Edward Waring, and he comes up with his own scheme. And so they go on resetting the society based on his scheme. Waring forgot to take into account the deficit that was already present, and so the, 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 the society went bankrupt or had to uh, reform itself 10 years later anyway. Um, here's an example of um, an annuity contract uh, considered by uh, the Equitable Insurance Society. You got uh, person A, age 64, person B, age 62, and uh, both uh, women want to purchase an annuity of 60 pounds for their joint lives and the survivor of them to commence after the death of C, a man age 60. So the man age 60 was probably supporting the other two and they needed an income after his death. So what do you charge? Um, so that was a, an early um, policy uh, sold by the um, uh, equitable, not equitable, So this is after these, uh, after Price gets rid of these uh, yeah. companies, yeah. and then he becomes a consultant to the new company. Yeah. Um, so he was a very prominent person, right? Yes. He was a member of Parliament? No, he was, wasn't a member of Parliament. He was, uh, he was a nonconformist minister, a Unitarian minister. He wrote a number of political tracts. Um, he was in support of the American Revolution, was invited to become an American citizen after the Revolution and declined and stayed on in England as a uh, writing economic tracts and, and continuing as a nonconformist minister. So he needed, so, but he needed to make a living. He was just Yeah, to he made a living as a, his living was either the money he made from his books or um, 
uh, his his uh, stipend as a minister. Which he supplemented by consulting. Yeah. So here is the effect of these of these actuaries or the, these proto actuaries going back to the London Assurance Com uh, Corporation and their um, one year term insurance. Uh, now these are dots are again the same thing. Is the the um, again they're charging five pounds per hundred pounds of insurance, and if you put in the correct uh, uh, valuation according to uh, the uh, normal methods of actuarial valuation, uh, the fractions are all over the map. They're still they're still overcharging. Uh, but starting in 1788 or so, they become a little more competitive. Uh, they're charging, uh, uh, or they, they're overcharging to the extent that they're 60% um, um, of the true, um, no. Um, take the amount they charge and then divide that into what they should be charging and it's somewhere between 0.6 and 0.9. So they're still overcharging, but they're but they're overcharging less. Yeah. So when you say should be charging, is that break even? Or? That would be break even. Right. And and what uh, uh, what they did was typically what insurance companies uh, do today, which is uh, you put on a loading for costs. Um, they also considered. Um, a more conservative mortality table or a different kind of mortality table depending on whether they're selling an, a, an annuity or a life insurance. So they didn't, if they were, if they were um, selling insurance, they were using tables where people live longer um, and so they could uh, charge enough uh, or live shorter because that would make it conservative. So they'd live uh, longer, they, they'd they charge too much, essentially, and it would be the the opposite for an annuity. Do you um, do you have any records, or do you know if they how profitable these businesses are? Um, the one for the um, equitable life uh, was it the equitable? The one started in 1762. I keep forgetting the name. Equitable. I think it's equitable. Um, there they they only folded about 20 years ago and all the records still exist and there was a, um, a history written of it and they were very profitable in the first 20 years of operation. And do you know where, where their premium lies on this, day, on this chart? Um, would they, be they, would, they would charge actuarially based premiums. So they, they, would, they would have different premiums for people of different ages. They were the first company to charge uh, insurance uh, based on actuarially based, properly actuarially based uh, premiums. Now this London Assurance is a profit making company. Yes. But a lot of these others were... Uh, They're also profit making, well they, they, they were, for the promoters they were profit making but they were meant to be, you know, for the benefit of the people. Uh, the, these uh, annuity companies. Members voted on this uh, changing. Yeah. yeah. And again, the members had no clue about the mathematics yeah. Yeah. and voted against their own interest. But was this equitable or membership uh, mutual? Uh, yeah, it was a mutual insurance company. Okay. Um, the Statistical Society of Canada on its website used to have and probably still does somewhere. Um, a set of pieces of advice from uh, David Cox on consulting. So this is number 13 in his list. Cox is an interesting, oh, he writes in an interesting way, he's very succinct. He gets a lot of information in very few words. And what he says is advice, piece of advice number 13 in consulting, don't be frightened to make strong assumptions when a preliminary answer has been obtained, then consider which of the assumptions might uh, be crucial. So this applies back to Richard Price on some advice. He was asked by uh, the insurance company that he worked for uh, the question uh, about um, essentially what's the chances of a man and a woman having, having a male heir? 
Uh, so the question uh, which you propose in the letter, uh, I received uh, from you uh, yesterday, is not a subject of calculation uh, for there are no rules by which the chance can be determined that a person uh, now unmarried shall hereafter marry and have a son who shall live to be of age. So he had, he said, I can't answer that question. But in a consulting problem a few years later, 1778, he did have to answer that question. So we have an estate. Now this, is, this comes from a, a real case of a, um, a guy who wanted to get married and he needed to have a marriage contract. But his estate was set up that he couldn't take any money out of the estate, so he had no money to make the marriage contract, so he couldn't get married. So the only way to do it was to borrow money from the estate that he owned, uh, but was so-called entailed. Other people were going to inherit, so he had to pay, set up a fund that would pay off all the other people who had interest in this property. So it starts with an estate, uh, is to descend after the lives of H.A. age 69 and I.A. age 27 uh, to the male issue of I.A. and his male issue of that male issue. But if I.A. does not leave male issue or no male issue that leaves male issue, the estate is to descend to G.F. age 22 for life and after the three lives of H.A., I.A., and G.F., it is to descend to the male issue of G.F., and for a want of such male issue, it is to descend after the three lives to H.F. Uh, and his heirs and assigns forever. So very complicated uh, life annuity contract. What Price needs to figure out is what's the chances of all of these people getting married and having heirs. And so he does this by saying, well, chance uses the uh, principle of insufficient reason and says, well, in order to do the calculation, the chance is equal to a half in each case. That each person will um, uh, live long enough to have a male heir, marry and have a male heir. And so he does this calculation. And what he has to do is find how much, uh, what's the worth of each of the people who have an interest in this estate. And then he has to send up, set up a fund to pay them off in case he dies and they inherit. Um, and uh, so his wife can have this, uh, so, he, so he's able to purchase uh, this marriage contract. Morgan also did consulting work. Um, he did an evaluation of fines for renewing leases on lives for the Diocese of Exeter. He did some estate valuations. He gave opinions on renewing leases for lives. He set up an annuity plan for uh, another society, um, essentially a, a, a working group that had a pension scheme. And he uh, uh, gave an opinion on a tontine. So although he worked for this insurance company, uh, he did other uh, consulting work on the side. Uh, there were ca uh, cases before the courts, uh, and the reason for showing this is to show that finally uh, these kinds of calculations, if they're accepted by the court, then they must be generally accepted. So the question is, when you're settling a legal dis dispute, should the price of a life annuity uh, be based on the market price, or should it be computed from a fair price? And the decision was that it should be the fair price, which is the actuarial based price. And the, if the court should take such a ground as to rest the case on the market price, then every transaction would come before the court and they'd have to have a lawsuit for every one of these cases. Now they have a general method um, uh, to evaluate these properties. Uh, William Morgan uh, was one of the people involved in the case, and another guy from the Amicable Society, the actuary for that society, uh, was also involved. Um, there were also similar disputes uh, with the same result. Um, whoops, I went one guy ahead. Um, and again, mathematicians were involved, and this whole thing was um, uh, now 
standard practice by the end of the 18th century to use uh, mathematicians to evaluate annuity contracts. So do you understand the argument as why uh, market price would bring everything into court? Because uh, the market price would be different depending, uh, the, you, you could, there's several different market prices. If you are selling, there's one price. If you're buying, there's another price for some reason. If you are, um, uh, if it's backed by land, there's a third price, and so on. So there was a huge variety of ways of pricing it uh, in the marketplace. And so the court didn't want to hear these time, the, the court was getting backlogged with cases, and they said, here's the rule, just follow this rule. So we don't have to hear from you guys again. So, um, in conclusion, the last slide. Uh, DeMauve and his successes were really peripheral to the life insurance industry during the first three quarters of the 18th century, which confirms Daston's point. Um, the insurance industry only took actuarial science seriously in the last quarter of the 18th century. But why didn't, uh, what were these mathematicians doing? Well, as I hope I've showed over the last hour or so, they were private consultants working on uh, pricing uh, life annuity contracts, uh, especially uh, property and related to property. Uh, what their mathematics books did was they gave them credibility as consultants. And um, all of this probably began with the Moab in the 1720s and continued for the rest of the century. Happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you. So, uh, I had a question. Uh, in this book, uh, Weisberg mentions that uh, like Huygens had some influence in uh, uh, Holland where they tried some of this stuff. They used... Um, um, they used... Um, they did life annuities, uh, or there were life annuities in Holland uh, that predated the life annuities that William III brought to uh, England. There were attempts to evaluate them, but there's, um, I'm not sure, it's, it's the, the evidence is not as firm as what's in England, or the stuff that's coming out of England, as far as I can tell. Time to break for a beer, no questions. <laughs> Can I ask one? This is slightly unrelated, but because um, I noticed that actuarial science has been much more prominently placed as a perhaps a track or something close to statistics in Canadian universities. Yes. When I was in Toronto, I had to take two classes in actuarial science as part of a statistics training. Okay. Uh, is there any reason to that? Is there something? Well, it, um, I, I tell you one thing, the, uni uh, uh, the first statistics program in Canada is the University of Manitoba. It started as, in actuar it started in the mathematics department. Uh, first, the actu an actuarial course was first offered in around 1910. Um, and a statistics course came along with it because uh, statistics was one aspect of what the actuaries needed to know. So, so it was the actuarial science that came first? Yes, at Manitoba. The actuarial science came as first. As part of the mathematics department, and then statistics and then, something. Well, no, and then the chair, or the head of the math department, and another guy in the department, had a, the actuary in the department, had a fight. Nice <laughs> academic fight. So, um, because the and this is a typical case now of math departments and stat departments, is the math guy was too theoretical and the actuary was too applied. So you're mixing oil and water. So he, uh, the actuary, applied to have a separate department. That was set up in 1937 or 39 or something. And so the, there was a Department of Actuarial Mathematics at the University of Manitoba and more and more statistics courses were brought in 
And there was another guy named Cyril Golden who was uh, in agriculture, working in design of experiments. He taught a course to uh, the agriculture school in statistics, and when they needed to house it in a department, they put it in the actuarial science um, department. And then in the 40s or so, they were bringing in more and more statisticians. Golden went, he left Manitoba and he got a big time civil service job in Ottawa. And so other people were hired to take his place and the statistics department then separated from actuarial science um, in the same year as Waterloo's department got set up. So Waterloo was similar but different. They started off with statistics because of David Sprott, uh, who was the chief, uh, the, the statistician helping to set up Waterloo. And they decided they, they would like to have actuarial science as part of the program. Um, a number of other statistics programs in Canada have taken on actuarial science because those students get jobs when they graduate with an undergraduate degree. So going back to Manitoba, you said, did I catch it right, 1910? 1910 approximately was the first actuarial science course offered. And they offered it at the same time as that course then? Um, a couple of years later they offered a stat course. And what, uh, and was it was, what kind of course was that? Is well, it would have been, uh, I think it was related to Ewell's theory of statistics because it would be related to the actuarial program. Um, and um, let me think here, Toronto also had, uh, Toronto, University of Toronto started off with an actuary in the math department uh, who started an actuarial program and then statistics came later. Pearsonian statistics got into actuarial science very early. Yes. Um, which uh, your former professor of the history of statistics, F.N. David, yes. uh, was initially wanted to be an actuary. She applied to a company uh, as an actuarial student and got turned down because she was a woman, I think. Um, and then she went off into statistics and a uh, number of actuaries, I think, consulted with Pearson, or wrote, there was, there was, Pearson was in contact with a number of actuaries, I think. So, um, uh, because of, of the Pearsonian curves, you could fit to, you fit a life, fit a life table to uh, a Pearson curve. So, uh, what were the first advances on Des Moines after Des Moines? Um, first advances, well, um, practical advances were somebody like Simpson uh, doing tables. Yeah. Um, so there'd be, and, and likewise Price and Morgan spent hours and hours and hours working out tables. So, uh, but when did they advance his linear model or his... Uh, uh, they didn't. They then resorted to tables. It was then not till the middle of the 19th century when you had... Um, uh, Gompertz coming up with his survival curve and then Makem coming up with his survival curve. So in terms of the mathematics, what changed mostly in the mathematics was um, smoothing techniques. How to smooth the, uh, the survival curve. Um, so there was a lot of effort put into smoothing methods. Which uh, one of the methods um, is very similar to um, 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 what's it called? Um, the non the non-parametric regression, um, kernel smoothing with spines. not spines. And while there's one that's related to spines, there's another one that's related to um, um, I forget. I'm old. So. So actuarial science remained a uh, kind of 
of an excuse, a support for probability, probability and statistics, yeah, it was, statistics and probability both yeah. in the universities. Uh, in Canada, at least. Uh, in many countries, I think. So I was looking for a, I was trying to find other translations of Huygens uh, into English, and I found one in, uh, about a very good one, I don't think, but in, or a very loose one in um, an actuarial, um, I think American actuarial journal in 1895. Because hmm. there were uh, translations of Huygens um, one by um, John Arbuthnot, yes. and another one by another guy in Brown, I think, Brown. in 1714. And then Stingler says it was the third in 1718, but I don't know what we mean. Um, there was another one that was in uh, Lexicon Technicum, it was called. It was a loose translation, very loose translation. Um, and there was another one somewhere else, I forget. Um, you know any that were from the Dutch? Uh, there was translation into Dutch. But from the Dutch? I mean, uh, I'm not aware. Because the Dutch was really more or less the original. Yes, and then translated into Latin. Yeah. Anything else? Yep. I'm curious about the, so the way you presented it is, uh, uh, I guess, originating in life insurance. Originating in property. It's in, yeah. And I guess I'm curious about if, if or what the, if, what the connection or if there's a connection between actual science to the origins, or at least the modern origins of probability in the games of chance, gambling. Because I guess if I'm thinking about what actual science is, is uh, effectively glorified uh, bookmaking or oddmaking. Yep and whether or not any of these ideas were somehow present before that, but in, not maybe not in insurance, but in, in some form of gambling. It was present to a certain extent in insurance because again, um, if you, uh, prior to 1700, um, you could buy marine insurance. Um, and related to the marine insurance, you could buy one year term insurance. And what happened was you went before a committee of people, they asked you a bunch of questions, and then they decided on what kind of risk you might be. It was, it was not numeric, it seemed. There was no numerical calculations. They decided if you were a high or low risk and charged you a high or a low premium, depending on what they decided, you know, how they thought you might survive the year. Um, that became mathematized in the 18th century. Uh, but it was more, uh, what's the feeling of this group? Um, and the feeling of the group was usually pretty good uh, because they made money out of it. Otherwise, you would have heard lots of, of uh, failures of these companies or of these people um, in the 17th century. Um, Related to game, when, they, when it started with games of chance, probability and games of chance, um, my feeling it was among mathematicians, some of them may have been gamblers, some of them not, and it was more like, here's an interesting math problem to solve, challenging problem. A lot of what Demois worked on as his probability problems were really challenging math problems. Um, and I think, I didn't, did, I don't know if sure I made it this afternoon, but earlier this morning, I made the comment that the problem of points or the problem of division of stakes is not a gambling problem. The problem of the division of stakes is you have money on the table, uh, you have so many games left to win, uh, what happens if you want to quit early? How do you divide the stakes? And I would say that's not a gambling problem because any gambler would, they'd play for the, they'd either play out the game or they would uh, toss for the stakes. They wouldn't come up with a mathematical solution to divide it. And they came out of the uh, Italian arithmetic tradition of dividing up uh, profits in companies. And the problem uh, there was 
and, and why there was such a mix up is the, the division of profits is you look to what happened in the past, but probability is looking to what happens in the future. And so once they had to get their head around that, then they could solve probability problems. And then the problems became more and more complex. Um, that if you look at uh, where Huygens published his treatise, it was in a, it wasn't uh, in a gambling manual. It was part of a, uh, it was part of a textbook. Um, and so it was meant for mathematicians, not for gamblers. The only one that was meant for gamblers was uh, Arbuthnot's translation of, of uh, Huygens' book. Um, and, uh, and with an addition of uh, some advice on how to gamble. Thank you.